Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Premier Chelsea, your source for all things Premier League, but starting with Chelsea first. Coming to you on your speakers and headsets, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm one of your hosts, Jackie. I'm here with my good friend, Rahul. And today we welcome back Ben Jacobs to the podcast to discuss the transfer window. Today is the opening day of the transfer window, and so it could get exciting. Ben will be joining us all summer long, hopefully on a weekly basis, to give us the latest insights that are going on. Ben, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be back. How are you, boys? Doing good, doing good. I'll pass it over to Rahul here because we've got quite a few players to talk about, mainly Chelsea for today, but Rahul, go ahead and get kicked off. Yeah, welcome back, Ben. And when we spoke to you about a a month ago uh, about the ownership details, I didn't think we would be here, but you were very confident and and had said June 10th would be the, the day that the window would open and hopefully Chelsea would be in a position to sign players. And here we are. So uh, let's get started. This one's a little interlinked and I, I no pun intended, but uh, Lukaku heading back to Inter Milan, Skriniar maybe coming over to Chelsea. Uh, what can you share with us? That's going to be the big one, isn't it, from <laughs> Chelsea or certainly the transfer saga that monopolizes the headlines. And unfortunately, from Chelsea's point of view, it's probably not a transfer that they either foresaw six months ago or wanted because let's not forget this is a hundred million English pound player. So $135 million that they only signed in August, 2021. And it's clear, and I suppose this is the bottom line that Lukaku wants the move back to Inter. It's the only club that he's eyeing. There is vague interest from Bayern Munich and also Arsenal. But if you gave Lukaku a choice of staying at Chelsea, moving to Inter or going elsewhere, he would probably rank it as Inter desperately wants the move and anyone else, he may as well stay and fight for his place at Chelsea. And the danger is, as this drags on, that not only is there bad blood developing between the fan base and Lukaku, but it's going to be even harder for Lukaku to try and resurrect himself at Chelsea if this move fails, especially because Chelsea naturally have to start thinking about and lining up replacements. So were he not to find a solution with Inter and stay at Chelsea through pre-season, there's highly likely to be another striker coming in who would end up being above him in the pecking order. So as it stands, Thomas Tuchel has said he's happy for Lukaku to leave and Chelsea's ownership group will also sanction the move, providing that it makes financial sense. The challenge is in defining what is financial sense and there's a range of options on the table. So the simplest one would be a loan move, and it's about all that Inter can afford, but how the loan move makes financial sense to Chelsea is the question. And obviously they're going to demand a relatively high loan fee, but what that loan fee is will be at least in part determined by how much of a wage cut Lukaku is prepared to take. And then there would still be discussions needed about, is it a loan move? Is it a loan move with an option to buy? Which I think would have to be into preference because they can't commit to an obligation to buy, but that is the other possibility. And if it's an obligation to buy, then effectively it's not just a loan move. It is a loan move that afterwards Chelsea can stagger a financial deal in order to get the maximum value. And still the parties have to discuss over the coming days what the value of Lukaku is, because Chelsea will obviously say, well, it's a player other than last season, dating back basically 10 years in the league. He's got into double figures every single season. He was 97.5 million English pounds. So where do Chelsea value him now, having scored eight goals in the Premier League last season? And Inter and Chelsea will probably be a little bit apart in where they value him. And then the final thing just to add is if in the terms, it becomes not just a straight loan deal or permanent deal, then there may be a swap element. And if there is a swap element, it becomes even more complicated, but that's where Chelsea might see the value. So Inter are not prepared, as I understand it, to let Lataro Martinez go, even when Dybala potentially arrives and that then leaves defenders that Chelsea desperately need. Bastoni's agent has said he's staying, so that makes Skriniar the most likely. Dumfries is another option, potentially. 
And Chelsea are open to that. Inter fans, I think, when I put out there that Skriniar was the one that Inter were open to getting rid of, went a little bit nuts and said, hang on a minute, he's a future captain, he's got huge value. But there has to be an aspect of force in all of this, not just between Inter and Chelsea, but Inter and anyone that comes calling. They can't keep having everything on their terms and their situation and the way they're approaching things and the fans are viewing things is starting to remind me of Barcelona where somehow they want, 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 but they don't accept the situation that they are in financially. So of course, if you're into, you're saying that Martinez, Bastoni, Skriniar are the spine of the team and untouchable, but there is a financial reality. And that's why when PSG have inquired about Skriniar, they've also been told that that player is available maybe for 60 odd million English pounds. And if Skriniar is forced to go, because Inter either want to bring in Lukaku or they just need a straight transfer fee from a PSG, then Inter will be open to that deal. So therefore that tells you that in a swap deal, he's also a possibility. So that's the sort of overview in the lay of the land. The way things stand at the moment is that Chelsea and Inter through their lawyers are now engaging directly to see whether there is a financial package that is market value to Chelsea. And if there is, Lukaku will be allowed to leave. And then going the other way, Chelsea obviously need to explore an option incoming. And if there is not a solution, there's the option of either keeping Lukaku over the course of the majority, at least of the transfer window, to see whether other suitors come in, or Chelsea may start offering him to other clubs. And that's when I think it will get the most interesting. I don't think that's the likely end game, because I think Lukaku wants Inter, will be prepared to take a wage cut, there's a range of options on the table. Chelsea and Inter will probably find a solution, but it might take longer than people okay. think. But if a deal gets taken off the table, then you have a scenario where Arsenal, Bayern Munich, and a number of other clubs may circle. And that will be quite intriguing because then you're looking at a straight transfer from clubs that can afford Lukaku, but their clubs Lukaku doesn't want to go to. Right. And the insight from that interest is going to tell you where Chelsea value Lukaku, even in the context of a deal with Inter. So I started by saying that Chelsea may see him as a hundred million English pound player, Inter may see him as 45 or 50. But if you start seeing talk of Arsenal circling at 60 million, Bayern Munich circling at 55 million, you start to determine how much in a straight transfer Chelsea might lose off their original purchase. And that's when you start looking at market value. And then you start being able to kind of work out, okay, what do Chelsea and Inter have to do to come to some kind of middle ground? And like I say, I think the bottom line here is Lukaku will leave Chelsea and Inter is where he wants to go. But is this a deal that can happen quickly? Probably not because of the complications in the negotiation period. And that might benefit Chelsea because it may give them the opportunity to find the striker first that they need to replace Lukaku and then get that deal over the line. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a messy situation. And if you had said to any Chelsea fan back in August of last year that we'd be 10, 12 months on looking to sell Lukaku or Lukaku wanting to leave, actually, uh, it's just disappointing and... and seems like we wasted, everyone just kind of wasted a whole year uh, when he could have just originally stayed at Inter. I know Inter had issues last year financially, so it helped them out. But uh, you mentioned bringing another striker, a uh, striker that we've heard of that's come up a few times is Gabriel Jesus from Man City. Uh, we've seen that Man City do want to move him on this summer. So is this an option? Is, does Tuchel want him? And, and do you think uh, if Lukaku does move on, Jesus may be someone that comes in? I think Jesus will be the bargain of the summer if, as seemingly is the case, Manchester City would be prepared to sell for 40 to 45 million. Originally, City wanted more like 55 million. Arsenal have seen themselves as the front runners and are also in desperate need of a striker, especially after Aubameyang went to Barcelona. Lacazette has joined Lyon as well. So there's going to be some competition, but I think... Chelsea would be a really good fit for Jesus. And by all accounts, 
Jesus has been offered to Chelsea. I think fans need to understand that when a player is offered to, that sounds like great, but it's not like when someone makes you a job offer and you say, cool, thanks very much, we'll take him. A player can be offered to multiple clubs. A player can agree terms with multiple clubs. And you only need to look at, say, Darwin Nunes, who will in all likelihood now join Liverpool, but Manchester United were very close to a deal. And Mbappe had effectively contracts agreed at least verbally, with both Real Madrid and PSG, and then made a decision. And this is the modern game and player power. So Jesus could very plausibly agree a couple of deals and then decide upon his options. But Chelsea are in a strong position there if they choose to pursue that. And by all accounts, especially with Lukaku's most likely departure, he's a player that Thomas Tuchel really likes. And why not? Because he finished the season on red-hot form, I think, in market value, he would be a bargain to any club in the 40 to 45 million bracket. He's a natural goal scorer. He's a good fit in the dressing room. So then when you see the possible striker choices that are on Chelsea's shortlist and who might be available, he's definitely a gettable player at a reasonable price. And if you offset whatever Chelsea get for Lukaku, that's a good trade as far as Chelsea are concerned. Now, naturally, if they go down a swap deal and, for example, they were to get Lataro Martinez, then you start saying, is that position covered and do they want Jesus as well? And you still have to factor in the fact that Arsenal are very strongly in the mix and serious about this deal and are slightly more advanced than Chelsea. But that doesn't really mean anything because we're so early in the window and a sensible player like Jesus, knowing that, his surplus to requirements at Manchester City isn't going to just go with the more advanced club when there's plenty of time left in the window to listen to offers. So I think that this one will be concluded probably by the end of the month by a club and Chelsea are very seriously in the mix. And as the days pass, you sense that Chelsea are becoming more and more invested in this Jesus deal. And it will be really interesting to see whether Arsenal and Chelsea end up in a bidding war over the player. But I think it's really important that any club Chelsea included at fast, because as teams around Europe that are chasing other targets and see the value in Jesus at this price, realise that they can enter the fray, there'll be more and more suitors. So if, for example, Bayern Munich don't get Mane, they may look at a player like Gabriel Jesus as well and that will be the case for a number of other teams that may lose a striker that Chelsea are currently interested in so when Unkunku moves or Oshimen departs or Jonathan David leaves all of which are expected over the coming weeks and months before the window shuts that's when you get the opportunistic elements of the window and suitors come in. And it's been Arsenal's downfall, really, that they've over-negotiated and been cautious in the market and allowed other clubs to come in. And they might fall victim to that with Jesus as well. But I think right now, even though nothing is overly advanced, Jesus to Chelsea is more likely than some of the other strikers that are being named. So if we look at who else is in the mix, and Kunku has been talked about with Chelsea and would be a fantastic signing, by the way. Jonathan David is another one. Raheem Sterling from Manchester City too. And there's certainly a possibility that Sterling could be tempted back to London. Arsenal and Spurs have loosely tracked him and Tottenham have actually tried to sell a little harder than most over the course of the last six months, which is natural in the build-up to a window opening when you're courting a player. And I think the belief was Sterling didn't desperately want to return to London and is still assessing his options. But if he's open to a return to London, Chelsea may see that as a fit too. And let's not forget, Sterling's only 27 and scored 17 goals in all competitions last season. So it would be another strong option. But right ben, now... Ben, sorry to look cut at you off here, names, Ben, but just a quick question on, on Sterling and, and his use. Do Manchester City not feel it's an interesting predicament to sell to rivals allowing some of the players because like you touched on Sterling 27 still very good and Jesus who is 25 I believe and for a bargain deal like that would you even want to sell to an English Premier League rival 
I think Manchester City don't see anyone as a rival <laughs> and everyone as a rival in a very kind of ironic way. Look, you could argue that the big six clubs will always be a bit reticent about selling to right. a rival, but I think City have their own strategy. They've got their own wider group and recruitment model that at the moment anyway is very different to Chelsea's. Right. And they're not going to allocate a name, particularly in their late 20s or mid to late 20s in Sterling's case, and say you're now surplus to requirements and they've got a lot of healthy competition in Sterling's position. And then Haaland has arrived as well. So that's a ton more goals. They just highly unlikely if they can get value back from a player and then potentially reinvest it or stock it up for another window if they feel that their big spend is going to be through Haaland. And remember, when we talk about big spend and factoring and what you're going to do as a football club, it's not just through a transfer fee, Dembele being a good example should he join Chelsea, it's through whatever you have to spend in agent fees, in add-ons, and naturally in wages too. And players like Haaland, therefore, uh, big outlays on virtually all fronts. So you have to sort of be conscious of that and to then turn around and say, well, we're just going to hang on to a player or only sell him to a foreign club doesn't make any sense and doesn't buy into the philosophy at the moment of Manchester City. And that's credit to Manchester City, not only because they don't just hang on to players for the sake of it, but because they are hugely respectful of individuals that have served their football club and Liverpool are the same and are outgoing. So if Sterling says to Manchester City, what's right for me and my family is a move to London, Man City are not going to say, well, sorry, we're not selling you to a Premier League club regardless or not a rival Premier League club. So your only option is Newcastle because we don't yet see them as a rival or Aston Villa, West Ham, Leicester, because they're below the top four in terms of where they are at the moment. You have to be fair. And if Sterling's not right for Man City he's up for grabs. And if Sterling's not willing to go abroad or to a non-direct rival, then why not Chelsea or Arsenal or Tottenham? And that's just the reality of the situation, as long as you can get the fee. And whereas with Jesus, he's a bargain at, I would say, early 40s in British pounds, in the millions. I think Sterling's price would be somewhere closer to 60 million. And I think Manchester City would see that as a good bit of business. So one thing I want to talk about is we discussed a little bit about Chelsea's struggles with needing defenders. And one name that's been linked with Chelsea over the last two transfer windows, give or take, and now it's starting very early and potentially could be the first signing if everything goes to plan, is a French international by the name of Jules Koundé. What can you tell us about the links there and anything that's going on around Sevilla and Chelsea's transfer business at this point in time? So Jules Koundé wants to join Chelsea. It's as simple as that. And the player has agreed terms and it's a very easy negotiation as far as the club player talks are concerned because as you say Chelsea thought they had a deal a year ago and Kunde's been in London and the deal is close and the challenge is not between Kunde and Chelsea it's between Chelsea and Sevilla and Sevilla's director Jose Maria Cruz de Andres has already confirmed that Kunde is looking to leave this summer. So when you understand that Sevilla know he's outgoing and accept the player wants to move and Kunde has already spoken to Chelsea, there should be no reason why this one isn't wrapped up very quickly. The challenge left in the deal is in the negotiation between Sevilla and Chelsea. And sure, there might be other clubs that have vaguely looked at him, Barcelona, Bayern Munich and so on, but they're not actively in the market at this point. So Chelsea need to work out how best to get to the amount that Sevilla want as an all-in price. And I don't think it will require a formal activation of the release fee that feels unlikely to me, but I think what it will require is 
10 or 15 million below the 68, 69 million release clause, and then a range of add-ons to get somewhere close to that amount. And once Chelsea get there, that deal should be wrapped up before the end of the month. Okay. And that's exciting news for us Chelsea fans because we are light on defenders. But I want to bring your attention to the attacking front one more time. This is a name that's been linked with Chelsea again and again, and that's Usman Dembele. And he's an interesting prospect because he has a relationship with Thomas Tuchel from his time at Borussia Dortmund. What are you hearing? I'm hearing he could come on a free. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Dembele to Chelsea has been a deal that's happened quite quickly and opportunistically because it was thought that he was angling for a move to PSG. And PSG's interest has cooled off, but make no mistake, it hasn't entirely disappeared. So there's three players in the market. PSG, which is actually... Dembele's preferred move, but there's nothing developing there at the moment. Campos was confirmed today as a advisor to the club overseeing recruitment and is not as keen on Dembele as perhaps Leonardo was, but that's not to say over the coming days and weeks that PSG still won't try and bring him in. The wages are high, but the free transfer adds market value and he's still a young player and one in form as well, with 13 assists in 21 games for Barcelona. So this is the sort of underlying irony of the situation that Dembele is finally fit and fits very well into Xavi's system at Barcelona. And Barcelona have had an offer on the table. And yet, for whatever reason, Dembele is delayed. And that's provided a window of opportunity for both PSG historically and Chelsea in the present tense. And because PSG have cooled off, that leaves Chelsea and Tuchel to maybe swoop in and agree terms. So there's been reports out there that the deal is close, that the deal is done. That's not my understanding. I wouldn't put it at 90, 95% likely. We're talking more 70 or 80% likely, but Chelsea have to move quick in the market because there's still a danger that PSG will return to the table. Now, internally within Chelsea, Thomas Tuchel has made it clear to Todd Bowley that Dembele is a player he wants. And Dembele is certainly open to a reunion with Tuchel. And that's the key dynamic and relationship because you would look at Dembele as a prospective buying club and say, I'm worried about how he's handled his exit. There's a danger that he'll unsettle the dressing room and the wages are incredibly high. But Tuchel knows how to manage Dembele and has made it clear to the new ownership group, this is a player that if it's financially viable and the wages and the structure are right, he would like at the football club. So Chelsea are looking to move fast on this deal. And at the moment, they are trying to establish a deal with the player who is open to those talks. And then from that point, they would naturally have the ability to sign him on a free transfer. Barcelona are saying they won't alter their offer. There'll be no improvements. And because he's not responded to that offer yet, positively or negatively, they're a little bit miffed and they feel like he's leaving them hanging, which again would imply that he would prefer to move away from Barcelona. So then if he's open to Chelsea, PSG have not ramped up their efforts to complete a deal. You have a scenario where Chelsea are front runners in that deal. But, you know, it all boils down to Dembele at this point. I think he'll pick Chelsea over staying at Barcelona, but how long is he going to leave Chelsea hanging in the hope that PSG come calling? And because obviously he's French and a French international, and he really enjoyed his time at Rennes, and he knows that that climate, that culture, that league, that club, all offers things that he wants, both personally and professionally. That's the one thing that Chelsea can't provide. You can sell the football club, you can sell the manager, you can sell the wages, you can sell the package. But if Paris comes calling as a city, as a climate, as a culture, as a league, it, I think, would still lure him there. But that offer isn't there. And the offer is further away now than it was when first talk started under Leonardo. So... As Dembele gets wind of that, unless PSG return aggressively, Chelsea will feel very confident of getting this deal over the line. 
And, and I think that's, I mean, I, I understand the, the, the preference to prep Harris, but I'm sure at some point he would want to get into preseason and get ready for next season. So <clears throat> hopefully that would be, again, towards the end of the month, like we were saying with some of the other guys. Uh, ben, we want to move over to some of the guys currently at the club that may potentially head out. We've obviously had Rudiger and, and Christensen leave. Um, there's talks of Alonso and Espelicueta, who I'll come back to in a second. But in the attacking front, we have Timo Werner, Hakim Ziyech, and Christian Pulisic, who are who haven't explicitly said it, but we have heard rumors and, and stories. So uh, if Dembele comes in, if maybe a Sterling comes in, do you see one of these three or maybe two uh, going out? I think one will go for sure. And Ziyech, being a bit part player, would probably offer the best financial value to Chelsea to sell. Werner could leave too. Pulisic's the most interesting one. And I feel like the new ownership group are not going to keep him only because of his nationality with their consortium being American-led. But there's a difference between Ziyech and Pulisic in age and potential, in future value. And with Pulisic, personally, I think he shows what he's capable of more consistently for the US men's national team than he does for Chelsea. And you only have to look at his assist the other day to understand what a confident, consistent Pulisic in the right system under the right coach can do, because he offers everything, vision, goals, and his finishing has naturally been inconsistent for Chelsea, so fans don't see that as often, but he could grow into that Azard-like right. figure if he's in the right system with the right mindset and the right coach. And that is the question mark. Is Chelsea's system, is the players around him, is the coach right for Pulisic? And Chelsea may argue yes, but if an offer comes in, Pulisic might be tempted away. And there's been links obviously with Liverpool, but my understanding is that Liverpool do not see Pulisic as their top target or replacement for Sadio Mane. And that will be even more so as slash when Darwin Nunes comes in and Pulisic would have to factor that into his thinking as well. How many games is he going to play at Liverpool with a Nunes and a Jota alongside the likes of a Salah? I know Firmino could leave too, but still there has to be the sort of understanding in Pulisic's mind of either developing at Chelsea Football Club or moving somewhere where he's going to play week in, week out. And that would be a warning sign for him as much as he might like to work under Klopp and Liverpool, how often is he going to play? And my understanding remains if Pulisic leaves, which is still a possibility, even though there's been no firm approaches or offers as we speak, that Serie A is a more likely destination for Christian Pulisic. It'd be a huge shame at his age and with his potential, though, if he leaves Chelsea, which is why I think that if a offer came in for Ziyech at the right value, he would be more likely to depart. And then once one goes, Chelsea don't necessarily have the onus or the desire to get rid of two. I'm not saying two out of the three names is impossible, but I think that there's a private acceptance within Chelsea that of those three one will be allowed to leave and perhaps Chelsea are open to offers for all three. So maybe it is a case of what offer is going to come in first. But I think once one goes, due to all the other outgoings and all the other areas and the fact that these are reasonably, particularly in Ziyech and Pulisic's case, versatile players that can play wide, that can float centrally, that can cut inside, that essentially can work in different systems... I I don't see why Chelsea, before ready-made replacements are found, would too seriously entertain offers for two of the three, as or when one of the three gets a concrete offer and departs. And and I think that's fair. I think even just from this past season, when we've seen uh, between those three how often Tuchel's played them, uh, you'd say Timo Werner and Pulisic have been a little more consistent, Uh, obviously not as much as they like, but I think Ziyech, with just the system, has been a victim of it. Um, you've mentioned a couple of more uh, positions in terms of further down in the pitch and defense that may leave. 
Uh, we know Alonso is maybe heading towards uh, Spain and going to Barcelona. As for Laqueta, too, we heard would might leave on the free. Uh, what can you share with us on those two? And do you think uh, at the expense of not losing too many players, they may end up staying? Well, I think Alonso wants out and has made it clear that a move back to Spain is his preference. It's going to be very difficult for Chelsea to keep him. Barcelona are naturally the favourites there, but Barcelona seemingly want to bring in everyone and they can't financially. And Javier Tevez at La Liga has made that clear. So somehow they find a way, don't they, every time to they sign do. players and then eventually register them. And it wouldn't remotely surprise me if that's the case with Alonso. But either way, he wants to move back to Spain. So I think he's as good as gone, even if the specifics of the transfer and the destination haven't been determined yet. Aspilicueta is more interesting. And at the moment, I think it's accurate to say that rather than having decided he wants to leave, he's simply determined that he'll hold talks with Chelsea over the next week or two to determine his future. Those that are close to Aspilicueta hint that he wants to leave, but he doesn't want to, as club captain, having been there for 10 years, get embroiled in a sort of bitter, acrimonious exit. And therefore, if an offer doesn't come if an option isn't available that is mutually beneficial to both Chelsea and Aspilicueta, he's not going to hand in a transfer request. And this is sort of a bizarre situation for a number of reasons. I don't actually mean bizarre in a kind of negative or odd way. I just mean that you've got Alonso and Aspilicueta that Barcelona both want. And I genuinely don't see Barcelona signing both of them. And then add to that mix that Aspilicueta is 32 and has got 12 months left in his contract. And you kind of say, well, what if you just, in a hypothetical, give Barcelona Alonso? Where does that leave Aspilicueta? And the answer is either at Chelsea or only at Barcelona if Chelsea are prepared to give him away. and. I think Chelsea would still argue that a transfer fee is required. And Barcelona may say, well, it has to be very low or nothing because he's got so little left on his contract, but it's still a year. And then is it inconceivable that Chelsea, for such a club servant, if nothing right comes in, would just say to Aspilicueta, why don't you just stay for a year and then we'll let you leave? So I think that an extension is probably out of the question to the contract. I think Chelsea are starting with the position that Aspilicueta wants to leave and they want a transfer fee. But if no one comes in with that transfer fee that Aspilicueta wants to join, i.e. Barcelona, who seem reluctant to pay for him for whatever reason, which is the bit that I find bizarre because there's 12 months left on the contract, then why wouldn't Aspilicueta just do one final season at Chelsea? And that's the difference between Alonso and Aspilicueta, that Alonso wants out. Aspilicueta is much more sanguine about the situation. Of course, he would like to leave, but he wants to be highly respectful of Chelsea. And he also wants to hear what the new ownership group have got to say. So even though it is accurate to say Aspilicueta would like to leave this summer, it's not impossible that he'd be persuaded to stay for another year. Whereas I think that it is a foregone conclusion that Alonso will return to Spain. And even if that isn't Barcelona, I think he'll find a way of exiting Chelsea to somebody because he just doesn't want to stay at the football club. Makes sense. And, you know, with Aspilicueta, I can speak personally. Someone who's been there long enough, I think, with an ownership change, with new players coming in, it's always good to have the club captain maybe do one more season and kind of usher in this new era before he goes off. But before we wrap up today, Ben, there's one name that's been linked with Chelsea for maybe more than a couple of seasons now, and that's Declan Rice. He's the final gentleman that I'd like to talk about today, which is what's going on there, because 150 million has been touted and those numbers are pretty huge, but it seems like Chelsea's pretty interested. What can you tell us about Declan Rice? 
Chelsea are definitely interested, but Rice remains unavailable this summer and West Ham are not budging. And that puts Chelsea in a really interesting and arguably difficult position because they desperately need to strengthen in that area. And there's not many central or defensive or box-to-box midfielders around of that ilk. And Rice has that versatility. So first and foremost, Chelsea want a defensive midfielder and a specialist. But if you can get someone that's sort of capable of going defensive to central midfield and even box to box, then you have a rarity in football. And there's so few players that offer you that defensive rigidness, but can score the odd goal, get box to box, and have got that stamina to provide you both defence and offence. And Kante falls into that category. Makaleli at Chelsea historically was also in that rare breed. And it's such a hard position to fill and it anchors your entire team. So of course, Chelsea want Declan Rice. A range of other clubs are naturally interested in him too. But I don't see anybody making an offer to West Ham United this summer that they'll accept, especially when you consider that West Ham want in excess of £100 million. And even if that type of offer came in, West Ham are still intimating that they won't be selling this summer and are very much playing hardball. And there's only so much you can do when you keep either upping your bid or trying to determine if it's gamesmanship and actually after the player says, I'd like to make the move, eventually the club softens. But at this stage, West Ham, who are trying to keep a nucleus to go from sort of the peripheries of the top four to one step further. And for much of the season, they look like they might be serious contenders. A little like Leicester, a couple of seasons back, were also hovering around and staying around. I mean, in Leicester's case, they got to the final game of not last season, but the season before and the one before that. And they were in a Champions League spot and West Ham feel that they can break into that. But to do so, they need the Bowens and the Rices of this world. So I don't think, and something could change, especially if West Ham line up a replacement. But right now, I don't think West Ham are playing games. I think the Rice not being for sale is accurate. And as a consequence, all Chelsea can do is line up a relationship and or an agreement verbally with the player for when the price drops or when West Ham are serious about selling. And yet, right now, this window, Chelsea need to address the Kante Jorginho situation. And even if they stay at the club, they have to find some player who is going to take on that mantle. So what do you do? You either put all your eggs in the rice basket and wait, but then anyone you approach now sees themselves as a stopgap or worries that Rice might come to the football club one day and they're going to fall down the pecking order. And that is the challenge, let's say, with a Calvin Phillips, that you've either got to say, I want Rice or I want Phillips, because you're not going to get both. It's financially impossible for any football club to bring both those players in. That's your 200 plus million gone. So then where does your Lukaku replacement, where does your Kunde and probably other defender come in from? It's just not possible, not without getting another 100 to 150 million in incoming transfer fees. Or you try and buy a player that's much cheaper and hope that that depth allows you to buy them now. And maybe, although highly sought after, so it's not a given Chelsea, when Rice is available, are going to get him. But let's say Chelsea are confident you choose to spend on Rice later and bring in someone now. So then if you're strengthening in that midfield position, you'd have to look at maybe a Hadara, who I think would be a great signing from Leipzig. Tielemans is available in the market. Arsenal think that that's a done deal at this point or very close. And they've certainly agreed terms with the player, but Chelsea haven't looked at Tielemans. But I only say Tielemans, not because I want to spark anything around Tielemans and Chelsea. I don't think there's substance there yet or at all, but... The price, that's why I mentioned Tielemans. Because Tielemans, even though he's not an out-and-out defensive midfielder, he's a box-to-box midfielder, but Tielemans is a central midfielder. And I think Chelsea prefer a defensive midfield specialist, but Tielemans is available for about 25 million. So you could try and buy a 
defensive or holding or central midfielder, whatever way you want to put it, for 25 odd million now, just to provide competition and cover. And because you accept that Kante, Jorginho, one or both could go very soon and then wait for Rice. Or, as I say, you've got to try and change West Ham's mind. But as we speak now, I don't think it's possible to change West Ham's mind. So I don't see Declan Rice going to Chelsea this summer. I don't see Declan Rice leaving West Ham this summer unless West Ham completely U-turn on their current position. And at the time of speaking, that does not look likely. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of the, the Holland saga from last year where Chelsea kept going back, or at least that's what we were told. They kept going back with the higher bid and eventually he, uh, Dortmund and him said no and we ended up with Lukaku and, and now we know how that went. Uh, but I think for for this week and the first episode, Ben, we've covered a lot. You've provided some great insight as always uh, and we'll look forward to having you back uh, hopefully next week and maybe talking about a couple of the low knees that may come, may come back, Connor Gallagher, uh, Levy Colwell, and, and we can see how they may fit into Tuchel's plans. But uh, for this week, uh, I think we've touched on a lot and, and we've gotten some great uh, information. So that wraps it up, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Please continue to subscribe, like, and follow us at the Premier Chels on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Instagram. And on Twitter, it's at Premier Chels. Uh, and if you don't already follow Ben, definitely drop him a follow on, on Twitter. It's uh, at Jacobs Ben. And on Instagram, it's uh, Ben David Jacobs. So uh, he's always updating, he's always providing uh, information and a lot of detail, which, which is very helpful. Uh, but Ben, thank you for joining us this week and I hope you have a great weekend and, and we'll jump back on next week. Yeah, absolutely. Just one final thing to mention as well, very briefly, because it has happened recently whilst we're speaking. I know this will air in a few hours, but right. it's also worth pointing out that whilst we've been on this call, Chelsea have confirmed who they've actually formally released and Andreas Christiansen is one of those players. So we now know for sure that he will be leaving Chelsea and then no real surprise in the other names that have been released, Danny Drinkwater, Charlie Masonda, and Jake Clark Salter. So we know a little bit more about the outgoings now that's official from Chelsea. And I'd also point out as well that there's one or two that think, well, the window's open now, who are Chelsea signing? But what we've seen on the women's side is yep. a lot of movement and I'm really excited by the confirmed signing today of the Canadian centre-back Kadisha Buchanan, who not only adds depth to Chelsea women's back line, but is intelligent, good in the air, has got decent pace, and I think is really going to help Chelsea solidify themselves, dominating domestically and also challenging the Champions League as well. So it's not correct to say that there hasn't yet been <laughs> movement. The ownership group have come in, the sanctions Absolutely. have been lifted, and Chelsea women have been busy in the market. I think that's their second confirmed signing already. So I think that it's not just a case of us getting excited about the ambition on the men's side. It's also important to note that there's Bowley going out and meeting quickly and on multiple occasions, Emma Hayes and Kadisha Buchanan has arrived today as well. And I'm really excited to see how she slots into the Chelsea women's team too. So I'm really excited for Chelsea's window because I think even though fans will get frustrated by the Lukaku situation and the Dembele potentially negotiations dragging on, I think by the end of the window, even though there's been a number of outgoings Chelsea fans may not have wanted, Rudiger in particular, I think Chelsea fans will be really excited by the incomings and it's going to be a good summer for Chelsea. Absolutely. And I'm actually glad you touched on the on the women's side because it's not just uh, Buchanan who's coming. Eve Paris had signed earlier uh, this week and, and Emma Hayes, like we said, is strengthening that defence and, and solidifying positions in terms of uh, going back into the Champions League and hopefully bringing, bringing that trophy home because that's the only one missing from her, her cabinet. Uh, but Ben, as always, we'll continue to, to chat with you and, and continue to touch on the women's side too, because I'm sure there'll be a couple more incomings. Uh, but we'll be back next week. But until then, stay safe and up the chills.